Turn your Bibles over to First Peter chapter one. Feast of Trumpets started yesterday morning. Man, I was wait, wait all day to hear him call us up. Man, seventh month of the Jewish calendar. So it started yesterday morning, Feast of Trumpets. I'm like, oh, I was way of working on our daughter's house, but I'm like, come on. <laughs> but yet we here we are. We anxiously wait to see his face. But you know what? Until then, we have the sweet hour of prayer, which is great. And uh, you just never know. I think over time, you know, the, some of the calendars have been messed up. We know the we have the seasons of Jubilee. I know the, you know, um, the Jewish calendar had only 360 days, and they would make up every so many years. They would add another month to make up the day. And I think over time, some of, I, I think we've probably lost some of that, you know, true calendar you know so i guess you just never really know the day or the hour but uh so maybe tomorrow still maybe to maybe the true feast of trumpets is tomorrow you just never know but i'm hoping he comes here soon it's getting uh to be a crazy world that's for sure but until then thank god that we can boldly go to the throne of grace we can pray for each other pray for ourselves read the word because when i read the word man my my, my joy is restored. If I watch the news too much, uh, it seems like my joy gets robbed. It's like, oh, it gets a little disappointing at times. We get home from working from the, my daughter's house yesterday, and my wife goes, can we watch something other than the news tonight? And yeah, that's about it, right? Learn to turn the news off once in a while. But last week we talked about uh, Greatly Rejoice. We'll get into that, but you know, our learning objective this week is as a believer, we're nearer to our salvation than we ever have been. What an amazing thing. In verse 9, you know, we're going to talk about verse 9, the end of your faith, the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Man, that is so good. So we're going to talk about this, that this week, again, closer to our salvation than we've ever been where we cross the threshold of absent from this body and present with the Lord. And ultimately, we talk about basically the three salvations. We have the justification, the sanctification, the glorification piece. And justification, the first salvation there is the second you trust in Christ alone, you're absolutely saved from the hell you deserve. Ultimately, saved from the penalty of sin. You, we all are sinners. We all deserve to go to hell. But justification, we're saved from that, saved from the penalty of sin. We're sanctification. That's daily living. Brian talked about it. It's growing in grace. That's our practical and progressive sanctification. The, the reading the word, we grow in grace. We're babes. We start off and then we become young adults. And then ultimately, hopefully, we grow up and mature in Christ. And that's that daily reading of the word, listening to music giving thanks, again, reading the word, growing in the knowledge of Christ, and then eventually the glorification piece, ultimately where we're delivered from the presence of sin. You know, the sin body, that sin nature, one day this sin nature, the sin body is going to die, and ultimately I'll be in the presence of the Savior, have a new body, a glorified body, an incorruptible body, and uh, one that will never sin again. And that's what we're talking about there. So that's what we're going to talk about. If you want to read about justification, you can re read Romans 3 through 5. If you want to talk about sanctification, you can read Romans 6 through 8. And then the verses I like for the glorification are Philippians 3, 20 and 21. You can turn your Bible over that. We can, all, we can look at that. For our citizenship is in heaven. What an awesome verse that is. You know, I'm not, uh, you know, yes, I'm a U.S. citizen, but I'm, I'm a citizen of heaven. I'm a child of God. For our citizenship is in heaven, from which also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Every day we should be looking for him. You know, he's coming back. He is. In 21, at the rapture, this will happen. Who shall change our lowly body, that it may be fashioned like his glorious body. And he had a body that, you know what? We know that when Peter was, when he was gone there, ultimately he was death buried and resurrected. And he came back for 40 days. 
He would just appear in the upper room. They would touch him. Doubting Thomas, he says, put your hand in the hole of my palm. Put your hand in the hole of the spear in my side. We know that when Peter saw him, when they were fishing, Peter jumped out of the boat and he ran and he hugged him. So this glorified body you could touch, but yet can still go through walls. You know, he, Jesus on the beach there, they cook some fish with Peter there and the other apostles and he eats with this glorified body. And that's the body I desired before. And that's the body that we're going to have, that he may be fashioned like his glorious body, according to the working by which he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. If you want to read about it some more, you can go to 1 Corinthians 15. It talks about the glorified body also, you know, in verses 51 and 52. But we'll turn back to 1 Peter. Last week we talked about verse 6, greatly rejoice. And I just want to review quickly about what we greatly rejoice in. And it starts in verse 3 and verse 4 and verse 5. That we're to greatly rejoice in that you have been begotten by the gospel of Christ. We're born again. That's 1 Corinthians 4.15. Begotten by the gospel of Christ. Born again by the gospel. That's all. We were in the jail this week. We had a few men downstairs and upstairs. You know, and Herman, uh, you know, he told the men to turn over to 1 Corinthians 15. And I'm sitting there listening and it was just, you know, just it was a, it was a, a beautiful moment for me just to sit there and listen. And sometimes, you know, I, I need to do a better job of listening. But if you turn over to 1 Corinthians 15, we should all turn over there. And so eloquently reminded, in verse 15 there, I'm not verse 15, chapter 1 Corinthians 15, verse 2, how Paul tells the Corinthians, he declares them the gospel, how they've received it, wherein they stand. Verse 3 and 4, how Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. He was buried and he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. But the point I want to make is verse 2, by which you are saved. It is the gospel that saves. There are, in Galatians there, you know, when Paul went up there on his first and third mission trip there to Asia, you know, and he went there the first time and they stoned him and killed him and threw him out of the city. You know, and he went and he writes a letter to Galatia and he reminds them there's only one gospel. There's only one. It is the gospel that saves and what a beautiful thing. And that's what I, we can rejoice in. We, uh, we can hear a verse a hundred times. We can read it a hundred times. But when somebody else sometimes read it and points it out, you're like, man, that is so good. It is the gospel that saves. We can rejoice in that. Greatly rejoice in that we have a living hope. Verse 3, 1 Peter 1, 3. A living hope it lives in heaven. A resurrected Savior. A God that can lay his life down for the sins of mankind. And a God that can raise, it himself, raise himself up from the dead. That's our God. That's Jesus Christ. We have a living hope. That's what gets me through the day. Because I, you know, I, 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 I think I would lose it if it wasn't for the living hope. We can greatly rejoice in that we have an inheritance that fades not away in heaven. It is reserved for us. It's undefiled. It's incorrupted. The glories of it never fade away. The glories of it never go away. That's eternal life. We can greatly rejoice in that we're kept by the power of God. And we're going to see that. We're going to use some examples there in verse 8 and 9. But we're kept by the power of God in verse 5. We receive all this by faith in the finished redemptive work of Christ. Greatly, re greatly rejoice in all this received by grace alone through faith alone, in Christ alone. In all this, we can greatly rejoice. Listening to a song, I think it's Pat's favorite song, it's like 10th Avenue Norris, and it's a song we listened this morning, Carl and I, and we're like, you know, the King of Heaven, He wants me. He wants me. He loves me. He wants me. But you know, I don't deserve any of that. And that's the God that loves me. And then we're going to talk about love. And you, you can get emotional to think the King of Heaven he wants me. He loves me. I have nothing to give him back. Man, that is so good. We're going to look at that in love today. We also talked about last week our trials. 
They do two, two, they do two things. Every trial in life refines your faith in Christ, just like God, just like gold that's purified in the heat of the furnace. The dross is removed. I was reading over in Jeremiah. You know, there's men that ultimately, they, they never ultimately uh, come to trust Christ in their Savior. Like Brian said, not everybody goes to heaven. And ultimately, an example of the furnace, it says they're burnt up. They're like lead, and they burnt up. There's no refining their faith. They're lead. They're not ultimately in Christ. They're not gold. They're not silver. They don't have the, these precious metals. They're not in Christ. They're lead, and they get burnt up. Don't be that person. Don't be the lost. You know, these, these trials that we go through, it's refining our faith and ultimately making us more dependent on Him, reading our Word. And in every trial is an opportunity to deepen our faith, grow in faith, praise and honor, and glorify Jesus Christ. If it were not for the trials in life, we know that if it was not for the trials of life, our faith would not grow. And that's the reason why Paul always says, I glory in it. Romans 5, James says he glories in it. And ultimately we read here, Peter, he says he glories in it. You have three, ultimately, men that wrote, ultimately, three epistles in the uh, New Testament, how they glory in it. Because you know it makes us more dependent on Him. Ultimately, it uh, just refines our faith. Love that. So again, if it were not for the trials of life, our faith would not grow. It's the reason why Paul said that he glories in it, because it is another opportunity to access the grace of God by faith. So we're going to start in 1 Peter 1.8. Peter writing to a bunch of pilgrims scattered through the land there, a bunch of Jews that were scattered because of persecution there. And in verse 8, he says, Whom, having not seen, you love, and whom, though now you see him not yet believing, you rejoice with joy, unspeakable and full of glory. Man, that's faith. That's faith. Something that, something that you have not seen yet believe. I've not met Jesus Christ. I didn't see him, but yet I, I know him. You know, I know him probably better than the back of my hand. Something that you've not seen yet love so much. Something that you have not seen yet rejoice. And we are to greatly rejoice, verse 6. That's faith. And you know, faith has a substance to it. Hebrews actually 10, 10 says that. It has a, a sub, maybe it's 12 or 10, but it ultimately has a, yeah, it's Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. But faith has a substance to it. You know what I mean? It's not a blind faith. It's not a leap in the dark. I hope there's a God. No. There is a God. And He's paid for all of our sins. And ultimately, that's faith. When you, you can not see it, yet see it through the Word of God. And ultimately, the trials of, of life strengthen your faith. The trials of life grow your faith. The trials of life grow your love for God. And the trials of life can never, ever rob us of our joy of eternal life. Because we're kept by the power of God. I just want to talk about love. We, have, uh, we live in a world today that uses the word love. We live in a world today that steals a lot of the words and ultimately images of God and they take it for their own thing. You know, the you know, first thing that comes to my mind is the rainbow. The rainbow has been stolen and I'm going to take it back. You know, every time I think of the rainbow, I'm going to remember God's promise that he will not ultimately flood the earth ever again. Some of these things we need to take back because Satan takes them and uses them for ungodly things. And love is one of those words. Love has been taken and distorted. And ultimately, to me, love is a sacrificial love. It's a nourishing. There's a, a feeding there. Do anything. That's the love of Christ. But we know that maybe the love of the world is more of a, a tolerance and acceptance. You know, yeah, you can do that. You know, and that, that's not what love is. So I want to look at the definition of love. I want to look at some verses. If you look at John chapter 13, we'll start there. So we know that Satan will often use the same dictionary, but he definitely, I'm sorry, he uses the same vocabulary, but he definitely does not use the same dictionary. But look at John 13. 34. A new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another, as I have loved you, that you also love one another. And he further explains that in John 15, 13. If you turn 
next verse over, next cha- couple chapters. It says, Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. So we can see sacrificial love there. But we know 1 Corinthians 13 gives us many different definitions of love. I want you to turn over to Romans 5, 8. Acts, Romans. But God commended, God demonstrated his love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So before I ever believed, he still died for me. It just shows you the love. He doesn't need you to make any promises, turn your life around. No, while we were yet sinners, the King of heaven died for me. And we can see here that love is actionable. You can see it. So we're getting a, a, a good definition of love. Now, turn over First Corinthians, First John chapter four. You want, you want to read a whole chapter about love. You can read First John four. It talks about how God is love. Verse sixteen. We're going to read that. So First John chapter four, verse sixteen. So it's back by Revelation. Beautiful book. It says, when we have known and believed the love that God had to us, we know it and we believe it. You can see it right there at the cross of Calvary. God is love. And he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God and God in him. Herein is our love made perfect, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, and so are we in this world. There's no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear, because fear hath punishment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love, and we love him because he first loved us. And this morning I'm writing this, you know, I'm like, God is love. Love is actionable, and you can see it. Love is sacrificial. At the pinnacle of love, it is giving your life for someone else. At the height of it, the zenith of it, it is when him dying on the cross. That is the, most, that is the greatest example of love. Him laying his life down for us. God loves each uh, one of us so much. He voluntarily left his glorification. He left the presence of heaven. He revealed himself in the flesh. He voluntarily climbed the tree of death. He voluntarily laid down and allowed men to nail him to a tree. He was forsaken so we would not be forsaken. All of the sins of the world were placed upon him and in him. His visage was marred beyond recognition. He could not be recognized. And I don't know if it was distorted from the beatings that he took or it was distorted from all the sins from noon to 3 p.m. But Isaiah 52 tells us he was marred beyond visit. You can even recognize him from morning to evening, a changed person visually. Could not be recognized. He was ridiculed. He was shamed. He was beaten. He was denied. He was betrayed. He died for every sin that every man ever committed. He went to hell for three days on paradise side. Abraham's bosom. He resurrected the third day and he sprinkled his blood in heaven. He obtained an eternal redemption for all of mankind. And he, Jesus the Christ, the Son of God, did all these things because he loved us. He loved you and I. Now I know I deserve to go to hell. There's nothing in me that's worth saving. Yet Christ loved me. And he did this for me because he loves me. And I love him. But I'm reminded in verse 19, we love him because he loved us first. However, he loved me and he demonstrated that love for me. He saved me from a hell I deserve to a heaven I don't. And I tell you, I mean, when we go to the jail, we often tell the men, when's the last time you've been told that you're loved? I had one guy actually answer me one time. Because a lot of times we ask questions, we don't get, in, get an answer. you know. But one guy goes, he goes, it's been a long time. Man, you see some of of these guys, they look hard and tough, but I tell you what, everybody needs to know that they're loved. And I tell you what, when's the last time somebody's told you that you're loved? 
Let me tell you, you are loved. You're loved so much that God died for you. Your God was buried for you and your God resurrected for you. And if you've not placed your faith in Christ alone, I hope you do so. I hope you believe the gospel that saves, just like Herman did. If you are a believer, a child of God, I hope you start to grow in grace and the knowledge of Christ. Have your love grow for Christ and our dad in heaven. When you first have a baby, they don't know what love is. I don't. You know, I mean, if you ask a baby, they can't even communicate. Babies do not know what love is. There are many babes in Christ that do not understand love. That's why we need to grow in grace, be nourished by the bread and the water of life. It's when you become mature that you can understand love. Jesus Christ always models desired behavior, and love is sacrificial. We love, we know love is many things in the Bible, so I want you to turn over to 1 Corinthians 13. And one of the cool things in 1 Corinthians 13 is verse 4 and 8. The word is charity in the King James. I do read out of the authorized King James, and a lot of times it takes the word charity and, and it switches it to like the word love. That's exactly what it means. In this context but you can also put Jesus Christ's name in there instead of saying love suffereth long you can say Jesus suffereth long it's kind love envieth not Jesus envieth not vaunteth not itself is not puffed up does not behave itself unseemly seeketh not its own I mean you could put Jesus in everyone in that context replace the word love for Jesus but let me read 1 Corinthians 13, 4, 3. Love suffereth long, is kind. Love envieth not. Love vaunteth not. It's not a vain display. Not itself. Is not puffed up. Doth not behave itself un unseemly. Seeketh not its own. Is not easily provoked. Thinketh no evil. Rejoiceth not in iniquity. and But rejoices in the truth. Beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. Love never faileth. For whether there be prophecy, they shall be done away. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. So we know that love are many things there. Patient, kind, envieth not, speaks no evil. But I want to talk about sacrificial love. People use the word love all the time, yet I see no... Hardly no evidence of sacrifice. I witness not a love affair. And I would ultimately, what I probably witness a lot of times in the world is more of an infatuation, a carnality, a lust, but not love. You love God? Sacrifice some of your time. Read or listen to the Word of God. Ultimately, get them on tape like Kyle does. Listen to the Word. You love God? Sacrifice some of your time and share the gospel with others. Love is intimate. Look up the word, it's intimate. There's an intimacy, and intimacy is something that is shared together. And let your time be intimate with God. I believe the first and foremost greatest gift is eternal life. Jesus the Christ giving all believers an eternal redemption. That is the greatest gift. But I also believe the second greatest gift that we've been given is the institution of marriage. There's nothing on earth that compares to the intimacy, a bond, a love, a closeness. A dearest friend, that is our wife. The closer I grow in my faith with God, the closer and more intimate I am with my wife. And it is the greatest thing that I've experienced on this earth. I want to encourage all husbands to read together, pray together, grow in grace and the knowledge of Christ together. And I say my wife is my best friend. And every husband should have their best friend be their wife. Some of the greatest Love verses in the Bible. Turn over there. Turn back to 1 John chapter 4. The gospel is love. 1 John chapter 4. And I say sharing the gospel is love. Many individuals don't want to share. They maybe get embarrassed or they hurt somebody's feelings. Spending eternity in hell, how does that compare to getting hurting somebody's feelings? Sometimes you just need to lay it out there. We know the gospel divides. It does. It divides. It'll divide son and daughter, son and 
or father, daughter, mother, son. It'll divide families. Matthew 12 tells us that. Luke 12 tells us that. But you know, we, sh- we still need to share it. Because let me read verse 7. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God. And everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. He that knoweth not, he that loveth not, knoweth not God, for God is love. In this was manifested, revealed the love of God towards us, that God sent his only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through him. Here in his love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins, a propitiation, satisfied sacrifice for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. No man hath seen God at any time. If we love one another, God dwelleth in us, and his love is perfected in us. By this know we that we dwell in him, and he in us, because he hath given us his spirit. And we have seen and do testify that the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. Verse 15, so we see we're to testify exactly the gospel. Verse 15, whoever shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God, and that's who he is. That's what we're to do. God dwelleth in him, and he in God. And we have known and believed the love that God hath to us. God is love, and he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God, and God in him. That's love. That is love. Sharing the gospel. Letting somebody know they're a sinner, they don't deserve it. A simple question I ask every week in the jail is, you know what, if you were to die right now, where would you go? Nine times out of ten, I get the answer, heaven. Why? Because I'm good. Oh, can you show me where it says in the Bible? They can't. I'm like, well, that'll never get you. Let me show you John 3, 16. I promise that you're safe from that. You'll never go to hell, and you'll always forever go to heaven. Jesus Christ did this for you. That's all I need is John 3, 16. And every week, somebody gets saved. Man, that's love. That's love. Turn over to Ephesians 5. Ephesians 5. Verse 23. Ephesians 5, verse 25. I mentioned the word love before as a husband to a wife. Why? Because... Marriage is a picture of something. Marriage is a picture of something. Let's read verse 25. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church, and he gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourish and cherish it, even as the Lord the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and shall be joined unto his wife, and the two shall be one flesh. This is the great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife, even as himself, and the wife, so that she have reverence for her husband. Reverence is a respect for her husband. This is why Satan attacks marriage today. This is why he tries to defile marriage. Marriage is between one man and one woman. My wife is perfectly and wonderfully made for me. And I am perfectly and wonderfully made for her. God made that for us. In a dark, dark world, a Christian marriage is a light. It is an example of Christ married to the church, which he never divorces. Never divorces. Never divorces the church. He loves her. He cherishes her. He nourishes her, and he forever takes care of her. That's love. In our marriage, your marriage is not vaunteth. It's not a vain display. Your marriage is bigger than you. Again, it's a picture of Christ married the church, 
and our marriages should ultimately be a picture of that in this lost world. Let's turn back to 1 Peter chapter 1. Verse 9. Receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls. We've looked at these verses a couple weeks ago, but I love looking at Scripture, so turn over to Philippians 1, 6. Ephesians, Philippians, Galatians. I'm sorry, what? Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians. I went backwards. <laughs> Philippians 1 6. Being confident of this very thing, that he who hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. The day of Christ. You know, uh, there's the day of the Lord and there's the day of Christ. And if you're saved, it's the day of Christ. If you're lost, it's the day of the Lord. Joel talks about the day of the Lord. First Thessalonians, I mean, we have Thessalonians talks about the day of Christ and the day of Lord. And the day of Christ, we're raptured. The day of Lord, judgment stop, comes. And there, you'll read those two phrases, the day of Christ and the day of Lord. But here, he who hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Turn over to First Thessalonians 5, 24. Faithful is he that calleth you, who also will do it. He that called you, how does he call us? Again, I try to always answer these every, you know, whenever I'm like, what does call mean? I always, and you know what? The answer is in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13 and 14. How does he call us? And the question is, have you answered the call? It says, but we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit, believe of the truth, unto which he called you by our gospel, to the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. So, the one that's faithful there in 1 Thessalonians 5, faithful is he that calleth you, who else will do it? The work that's Started you, he will finish it. Look at Second Timothy one twelve. For which cause I also suffer these things, nevertheless I am not ashamed. I know who am I believed. I'm persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. I've committed unto I know I'm gonna be saved. I know I'm gonna be right, I know I have eternal life. I trust in his word. And then Romans 13, 11, you don't have to turn over, are we? And that knowing the time, that now is high time to wake out of a sleep, for now is our safe salvation nearer than when we first believed. How great is that? Let me read 1 Peter 1, 9 again. Receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls, it is great news to hear that we are near, closer to our salvation when we first believe. We're nearer to having our souls delivered. We read in 1 John 4, 18, that a perfect love casts out fear. Brian talked about fear last week. Matthew 10, 28, we read. But here it says, there's no fear in love, but perfect love casts out all fear because fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. And I say this, if I have if I had to have confidence in my own rituals, my own sacraments, my own traditions, my own work, my own obedience, my ongoing faithfulness, there would be absolutely no confidence in my ability and I would be living in constant fear. For example, if I had to follow religion that believed in rituals for redemption, for example, walking to the front of the church and giving my life to Jesus, speaking in a tongue, etc., etc., after the act, I would be questioning the motive. Did I really do that because I, for him or was I doing it for to impress all the people? I don't know. I would be questioning it. It was not done in perfect love and there would be a fear. For example, if I believed in a sacrament for salvation and going to a confessional for absolution of sin after the act, after confessing, I would be questioning my motives again. I'd be like, did I confess everything? No, I didn't. I didn't really want him to know this thing. 
And immediately I would be starting to think of things I did not confess, which means I would then need to go back and confess those things that I did not confess. And my thoughts would be racing and be a vicious circle. And ultimately it was done not in perfect love and there would be constant fear because I wasn't honest. For example, if I believed in my works for salvation, all my good deeds, when I was laying on my deathbed, I would be like, did I do enough? My works were not done in perfect love. And there'd be constant fear. And I have no confidence in any man-made religion, of man-made doctrine of religion. There's not a man-made religion that is complete and perfect love. Not. Because that did not come from man. It was revealed. It was given to Abraham and ultimately shared with Adam and Eve and shared with Paul. It was preordained before the creation of the world was ever made. So I have no confidence in any man-made doctrine of religion. There's not a man-made religion that is complete and perfect love. There's not a man-made religion that can cast out all fear. However, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, revealed himself in the flesh, died for all sin, was buried, resurrected the third day. He sits at the right hand of the Father today. He holds on to every believer. The Father holds on to every believer. And every believer is sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, marking them as God's child, forever guaranteeing them in the entrance, entrance into heaven. That's something I can find confidence in. That is perfect love that casts out all fear. For man can do nothing to me. Sure, might be able to take my property, take my life. But you know what? He can never take my freedom. He can never take my joy. And he can never take my eternal life. That's in Christ. And I say our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. The salvation of our souls are nearer today than when we first believed. If Jesus Christ does not give you eternal life, he doesn't give you nothing at all. He gives you eternal life. There's no church that can reconcile. There's no ritual that can redeem. There's no sacrament that can save. No tradition that can justify. No work of man that can deliver you from the pits of hell that you deserve. Only Jesus Christ can reconcile, redeem, save, justify, sanctify, glorify. Only Jesus Christ can save you from the abyss of hell to a heaven you don't deserve all received by faith in him. That is a perfect love. There's no fear in the finished redemptive work of Christ because it's finished. We're closer today to heaven than when we first believed. I've lived over half my life. I'll be 50 in two weeks. There's no way I'm going to live to be 100. Got saved when I was young. Door Lake Bible Camp closer today than when I first believed. Paul said to live as Christ. We know Christ suffered, Christians suffer. I say, do not be deceived by a prosperity gospel, a false message by men. The prosperity gospel says there is a financial gain and a healthy gain, a healthy well-being is always the will of God. That's not the case. If they say, if you're sick, you must not be You must not be in fellowship. That's a false message. If you don't reap the harvest of thousands of dollars, they say, oh yeah, you you must not be saved. They use that message to rip people off, keep people in distress. A prosperity gospel gospel is a false message. They say, if you plant a seed of $1,000 to help sow a harvest of 10,000, and ultimately a physical well-being, you're going to be healthy. But then when it doesn't happen, they're like, well, there's something in your life, you know. That's why you didn't receive it. That's why you're sick, because you're not faithful enough. You're not obedient enough. And that's a false, 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 deceitful message, because we know that every believer will have trial in their faith, because we are not citizens of this world. We fight against not flesh and blood, Ephesians tells us. We're going to get persecuted. We know that First Peter 5, 8, Satan roams around like a roaring lion, lion like whom he can devour. He comes to try to destroy our testimony. That's what he wants. You are going to receive persecution in this world. We live in the greatest country, founded on Christian principles, yet we know that an enemy wants to destroy that. And it wants to be like the rest of the world. You can go around the world where the Bible, we know the Bible is outlawed in 51 countries of the world. The gospel is outlawed in like 51 countries in the world. I know Pastor Benjamin, when he, we were over in the Philippines, he went over to Laos and he went into Vietnam. He couldn't even bring a Bible with him because that ultimately the border, they would confiscate it. We know that socialism is an anti-God. They want you to depend on the government. That's what the world wants. That's a Satan system. That's a deceitful message. 
Christians are going to be persecuted for our faith. Even though we've had a, a, a season of little pain and little labor, I tell you what, Christians will be persecuted in this country. It's starting and we're going to see it even more to come. Paul said to live as Christ. Christ suffered. Christians suffer. We've read it in Romans, James, Peter, that life will have heaviness. But you know what Matthew 11 tells us? To yoke up with Christ. There will be trials. There will be suffering. That's a fact. We know that. Not because we're not faithful. Not because we're not obedient. It's a fact. Why? He does this for two things. Remember, to purify our faith. Make us more dependent on Him. And to glory in Him. So that's a fact that all this is to grow your faith. Strengthen your faith. And God is a faithful creator. And He works everything for good. He wants us to... Lost people to look at somebody that's going through persecution and be like, and the lost can be like, what's different about these people? And they can see through your suffering and through your trial that like, oh, man, you can share the gospel with these people. Maybe your doctor, maybe somebody can hear the gospel. So it's a fact that all this to grow your faith, strengthen the faith, because the God, God is the faithful creator and he works everything for good. So God might use your trial, your suffering, so others can hear the gospel and get saved. And we know that people use Philippians 4.13 all the time for their own personal well-being, but it's related to 1 Philippians 1, 21 through 23. You know, to live is Christ, to die is gain. But here, over in 4.13, suffering is ended and forever in the presence of Christ. This is why Paul said in Philippians 4.13, I can do all things, through Christ, which strengthened me. No matter what trial we have as believers, we can get through it. Because at the end of the day, we're nearer to our salvation. If we die, we're in the presence of God. So in all the suffering life, I can do this with Christ. In the last moment of my life, when your mortal life is fleeing from you and you're ready to step from this life to the next, the last time you close your eyes here on earth, first time open them in heaven, it is Christ that strengthens you. And allows for this to happen. When I'm in a room like Terry Hansen, and he says, you know what? Nobody cry for me. He's got a brain tumor. And he says, nobody cry for me. He says, I know where I'm going. When you're in a room with 20 people and he says that, people are like, that gets people's attention. They're like, what is different about this? Because most people are probably dying on their death, not wanting. And he's like, don't cry for me. I'm going to a better place. To live is Christ. To die is gain. To an inc- a cr- inheritance that's incorruptible. The glories of it never fade away. In Philippians 1.21, turn over to it. Philippians 1.21. We're in the jail one night and I actually said, somebody made a comment. I'm like, to die is gain. I'm like, kill me now. <laughs> it was like, and I'm like, they, they, they didn't know how to take it, but I'm like, go over here and read this. I says, man, as a believer, to live is Christ. We're going to receive persecution, but to die is gain. Anything that I have in this life, the next life is gain. It's better. Philippians 1.21, for me to live is Christ. And how did Christ live? He lived suffering. He was born in a feed trough, born of a peasant. He had to, when he was born, he had to flee out of Nazareth. He had to go down to Egypt because he was, pers- Herod wanted to kill all babies because they knew the, the, the wise men came out of the east and they were looking for the Savior. He was persecuted at birth. And they had to move around and his friends even betrayed him. And we know he was 33 years suffering. To live as Christ, to die as king. The second time he comes back will be to reveal his glory. He will not be the suffering Savior the second time. The second advent, he will be the Lord of glory. And we're going to, First Peter talks about that in a little bit here. But you know what? For me to live is Christ, to die is gain. But if I live in the flesh, this is the fruit of my labor. Yet what I shall choose, I know not. For I am in a strait, between the two, having a desire to depart, to be with Christ, which is far better. Yet verse 24 knows, Paul knows that he's needed so others can share the gospel. 
He needs to abide in the flesh so others can hear the gospel. Turn back to 1 Peter. So we see here 10, 11, we'll get into this next week, of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you. Searching what? Or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ who is in them did signify when he testified behind the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. That's our lives. We see it. Our, you know, we will have suffering in our life to grow our faith. Ultimately, so we, the Lord, if we know in 1 Peter 4, 4, turn over 1 Peter 4, it's, uh, yeah, 19. Wherefore, let them that suffer according to the will of God. He's our dad, and he works everything for good. Commit the keeping of their souls to him in well-doing and unto a faithful creator. Maybe he has you going through a trial or a suffering because somebody in your life, a child, family member, a friend, needs to hear the gospel. I guarantee if you'd ask my mom and dad, oh, you, we want our baby to die, they would have never said, take my baby. Finally, after 40 years, my mom can say, thank God my baby was taken. Because, you know, my mom got saved, my dad got saved, I got saved, and my other sister got saved. It's through that suffering that they went through, they recognized Jesus Christ, the love that he did for them. And we're going to forever be with Carrie in heaven. And there's people here that went through the same thing. How the Lord worked in your life to bring you where you're at today, brought you through to understand salvation. What an awesome God we have. Let's close in prayer and we'll sing our last song. Herman, would you uh, lead us in prayer?